This meeting will come to order. The day is Tuesday, April 11, 2017. This is a study session of the Prescott City Council. Roll call, please. Mayor Olberg. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Lamerson is absent excused. Councilman Lozell. Here. Councilman Blair. Here. Councilwoman Orr. Here. Councilman Shiska. Here. Councilwoman Wilcox. Here. You have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Um, looks like we got a couple of uh, items a day that might be of interest to the public to, to comment on, so I will take a public comment on all three items a day. Item one, please. Annual U.S. Forest Service Fire Threat Briefing. Good afternoon, Mayor, Chief Light, City of Prescott Fire Department. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to introduce uh, one of my un uninvited guests, but uh, she's shadowing me today. Jeannie Grovers is a class uh, associate from the Prescott Area Leadership. Uh, she, I was beneficial to become the recipient of a shadow opportunity, so I've been hosting her throughout the day. But be, uh, with that, we'll go ahead and begin. With us also today is Sarah Tomsky and Pete Gordon and Jeff Andrews from the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, they're going to provide you kind of a general overview and an outlook for our particular wildfire season as it approaches. So with that, I'll turn it over to Pete and Sarah and Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Mayor, City Council, uh, thank you for allowing us this opportunity to pr give you some information. Um, Sarah and I are just going to kind of tag team it today. I've given you a handout. There's a lot of information there. And of course, we'll go through some slides. Um, but I uh, want to share a few things with you. The first, um, if you'll see on this first slide, I want to bring to your attention the, uh, the picture there. That's uh, a seal, for lack of a better word. That's uh, a representation of what our Prescott National Forest Fuels, Fire, and Aviation Program stands for. And I want to make particular note the, the word fuels being first in there and the first bullet. We call those our pillars of action, and that's fuels management. I hope uh, today to portray why that is so important to us uh, and talk a little bit about the partnership and cooperation with the city of Prescott and how that leads into successful fire suppression. Let me get my tools here. All right. This first slide, uh, what this map portrays, this is a product from a risk assessment done in the southwest region in 2015 uh, and, and they provided the Prescott National Forest some specific data to, to us. What this first map shows is the probability uh, that a fire may occur on the Prescott National Forest or where it may occur based on historical fire occurrence and historical fire weather. Um, and as you can see around the city of Prescott, uh, Prescott there's uh, several colors of red and yellow where it's more likely to occur, again, based on history. What this tool uh, provides, among many things, but foremost is a tool for help us prioritize where we might want to uh, invest in some fuels treatments. Can I add? Yeah, absolutely. So I just want to add, because if I was a member of the public looking at this map, I may think, oh my gosh, we all moved to the place where there's the highest level of risk. Well, I think what actually um, you all would probably be able to deduce is that a lot of those are human-caused fires, and so being close to a population area, we actually have seen a lot of fires caused by people recreating in and near the public or um, fires coming off of private property and coming onto national forest. The last thing I'll say about this particular map, one thing it is not good at is predicting the rare event or the isolated event where we might have the worst fire conditions in June and a fire may occur somewhere where we've got alignment with the wind and the topography. Uh, but it is a good uh, tool for planning based on statistics and probability. This uh, picture here, these are uh, two maps showing you 10-year uh, history. On the left is prescribed fire treatments done in the last 10 years, and on the right, mechanical treatments. And mechanical treatments includes mastication. That's the big machines like a mulcher, a lawnmower uh, that goes and, and shreds the brush and small debris. It also includes mechanical hand thinning with chainsaws, some of the small diameter material in the forest, as well as some of our uh, timber treatments, the small scale uh, timber sales we've had in the area. Um, overlaying them, the two, if you look at the map displayed here, the hard map, this is this year's update. The pink areas represent the, some of the accomplishments in the last 12 months. Overlaid with all of those green polygons is the combination of the two you see on the screen. The reason I want to share this with you uh, is, number one, I want to point out, hopefully you might be able to see a similar pattern in the treatments 
on both of these, as well as going back, do you see a correlation with the pattern of where the most risk is on, based on probability? Um, there's no coincidence there. Proud to tell you that the history, the 10-year history you see there, really goes back 20 to 30 years on the Prescott where we've done treatments around the Prescott Basin, well ahead of anybody helping us with this assessment tool. But it validates that we're putting the right dollar in the right place. At the bottom of the screen there, very dear to our hearts, is sort of what I call a new approach or a new way of thinking, at least internally, and we're trying to share it external with our partners. Uh, and those that uh, collaborate with us both in fuels uh, treatments and suppression. But the idea that the first step to successful initial attack or successful suppression of a fire really is the hazardous fuels treatments. Uh, in other words, you know, it, it, for the last couple of decades, if not longer, we've really put a foot forward thinking that we're doing this work to protect communities. Well, we are, but what I'm trying to convey is that we really need to protect the firefighters first because if we can't get them in to a place with less risk and where they have a probability of success, then they can't do their job to protect communities. So we're trying to put that right out front. Internally, that's how we talk with our folks that are doing the work. That's how we're trying to talk with our partners uh, is a new way of thinking. It's really about firefighter safety and then public safety and protecting communities. I want to uh, talk just quickly about uh, cost effectiveness of doing this type of work, the fuels treatment, whether it's mechanical or prescribed burning. Uh, and I want to do that in comparison or uh, in relative to the cost of suppression. And I'll use the Dosi fire uh, as an example, our most recent large fire on the forest adjacent to the city of Prescott. That fire was a little over 6,000 acres and it cost a little over $6 million to suppress that fire. And you're probably thinking that's a lot of money. Well, it is. Coincid or incidentally, um, that really was sort of a, a lesser expensive fire. Um, it's not uncommon to be in the tens of millions of dollars on a fire in the urban interface. However, it, it, it does paint a picture, as you can see, over $1,000 an acre, if that's the way you want to look at it. And we have the ability to treat some of these areas in the hundreds of dollars per acre. Plus, the investment is long term. We have the ability to uh, decide when it is appropriate based on conditions uh, to do that kind of work. And we, don't, we aren't afforded that luxury when there's a wildfire uh, dictating how we're going to respond. Um, I think uh, I want to come back to this idea of protecting firefighters before moving to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we're working on, and, and perhaps you want to address a little bit of this life safety, but it, it's a, a new way of looking at things from the Forest Service as a whole nationally. Um, we've got some efforts forward we're calling Life First where we're taking a good hard look at uh, exposure, asking our firefighters to think before taking action. And I don't know if you have some things you want to share on that. I do, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that we remind our firefighters, but especially our brand new firefighters, firefighters that start off with us as seasonal firefighters and hopefully eventually become permanent Forest Service wildland firefighters, one of the things that is really critical to me as the district ranger and as a line officer is to remind our folks that we are federal land managers. Our job is to do the best we can to manage the natural resources. And a lot of our brand new firefighters, they come in getting great training on how to suppress a wildfire, but we're trying to do a better job of when we have them here, making them realize that First and foremost, we are land managers. And that really comes to play when they're put in difficult positions of having to um, respond to a wildfire that's co close to a community. They have a lot of personal pride and obligation that they feel in doing their best to protect the community. And we absolutely understand that. That's an important driver for us as well if we have a fire that is um, threatening our communities but it's really great for me to have an opportunity to tell you what I'm telling them, which is please remember the very first thing they need to do is think about their own safety. But for us, our obligation as land managers is to make sure that we are thinking about the communities at risk, doing those fuels treatments, hazardous fuels treatments around the communities so that if we do get a fire that is approaching the community, we're giving them a safe place to make a stand. Um, I think one thing I wanted to mention, and Pete, maybe you can speak to this, is the Indian Fire. Um, since I've moved here, I've heard a lot of people reference the Indian Fire. The thing that people say a lot 
is the only reason town was saved was because the wind died down. And one thing that I want to use this opportunity to do is to really reiterate that actually there was a fuels treatment that that fire ran into. And the wind and conditions certainly helped, but if it weren't for the fuels treatments that we had done on the forest, um, I don't think we would have been able to put people in there safely. Can you, is that accurate? Yeah. Right, and so the other thing before we move on to the next slide, and you may be speaking to this more, Pete, is the reason we're really taking this opportunity to, to tell you about this is, as you can see, our land is interwoven with a lot of city land, private land ownership, and county land as well as other federal and state partners. And I really want to thank you for supporting the collaborative work we've been doing with City of Prescott. We do a lot of work um, on a biannual basis to coordinate the fuels treatments we're doing, and I just want to thank you for that continued support because it means we can look across jurisdictional lines and put those fuels treatments in where they're most effective. We didn't rehearse this, but that's a wonderful segue. I want to, before we leave this slide, um, yes, the one of the things I wanted to speak to uh, at the end of this slide was the collaboration it takes um, to provide safety for those firefighters so that they can protect the community. And, and uh, Sarah has already thanked you for that collaboration. It is a collaboration not only between many of the agencies and governments that serve the public, but it's the citizens as well. They're a, they're a big part of that uh, triangle of support, if you will. So, um, And yes, the Indian Fire, um, I believe I, I referenced that in your notes um, that you can look at later, but without a doubt it did. Uh, it allowed the air tankers and firefighters to be uh, effective that they probably would not have been had there not been some thinning and mastication work at the head of that fire. Okay, this product that you're looking at, I think we can jump ahead a little bit here. Um, this product you're looking at came out of that same risk assessment in 2015. And what this slide is trying to depict is what's called net value change, or really what is the trade-off. Uh, if, if every acre on the forest were to burn, it helps us look at what is the net effect, either a benefit or uh, the risk of damage um, to something. Uh, the uh, values that were a part of this assessment is the wildland inter inter urban interface, of course, the community boundaries, our recreation opportunities, infrastructure, wildlife habitat, uh, timber values, rangeland values, uh, cultural values, um, and uh, watershed, of course. And what it does, uh, as you can see, based really on science, uh, we know, I'll talk a little bit about this in the next slide, but we know that fire has played a role historically, ecologically, on the ground as part of a healthy ecosystem. Um, and so a lot of that is portrayed here. You see very little red, and where you do see red um, is really of no surprise. And once again, let me draw your attention correlation. This pattern looks very much like the probability pattern as well as where we're investing in treatments. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So one thing that's important for me as the district ranger when I look at that map is looking at all the areas of blue. So again, the areas of blue are areas where fire actually can have some benefit on the ecology. And so the reason I want to mention that to city council is because another reason that we do the fuels treatments and prescribed fire in particular is science tells us that getting fire back on the ground has a beneficial effect. So oftentimes around town, we're doing fuels treatments that are really hazardous fuels treatment. We're trying to mitigate the risk to the communities. But oftentimes there are the added benefit of getting fire back on the ground. But the other thing to keep in mind is that when we do get a wildfire, a natural ignition, a lightning started fire, um, and we're looking at those maps, if we see somewhere on that map where having fire on the ground is actually going to have some benefit to the resources, it's another thing that we want to consider. Um, we're always considering firefighter um, and public safety first when we're making decisions about how we're going to approach a, national ignition, a natural ignition wildfire. But it's important for you all to understand that if we do have an opportunity to really take advantage of putting fire back on the ecosystem when conditions are appropriate and we know that our firefighters can safely take that on, um, we're going to look at that as a very real possibility. 
what that means for us in the community of Prescott is we may see extended periods of smoke. And it's something that we're always considering. We're always talking to smoke management experts, air quality experts, and certainly listening to the public. But it's one of those things we're looking for support for and understanding why we take those advantages, uh, take advantage of those opportunities when we have them. Yeah. When you say fire back on the ground, I think that I know what you're talking about, but could you make sure I know what you're talking about? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So um, the Forest Service for 100 years um, was operating under the impression that when we did have a wildfire, whether it was human caused or lightning caused, that our obligation was to put that fire out as quickly as possible. One of the reasons is because um, we were protecting at the time, historically, resources, for instance, timber. You know, there may have been no people around, but we understood that timber was a commodity. What we didn't realize that after hundreds and hundred years of putting every fire out and keeping it as small as possible is that we were actually harming that resource over the long run. So the fire um, plays that role of cleaning out the understory um, and allowing forests to go, grow healthy and strong. When I say put fire back on the landscape, I'm referring to the history that we have where we've actually kept fire off of landscapes where historically Mother Nature would have put it. And we've got some responsibility as land managers to get us back to that historical role that fire does play. Does that answer your question? Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, sure. Again, nice, nice segue. Um, the next slide I want to talk a little bit. Um, Sarah did a nice job of, of giving you a, a sort of insight into the options we might have with a lightning fire or natural ignition. Um, what I'll do is let me just highlight and speak to a couple of things. When it comes to uh, policy, um, federal wildland fire policy, which uh, governs all five of our federal land agencies that manage the wildlands and manage fire, we look at these fires as non-structure fires, and there's a nomenclature associated with that, and it's really there's two options when we talk about uh, wildland fire as opposed to a structure fire. And that's either a prescribed fire, which is a planned event, or a wildfire, the unplanned event. And what I'm addressing here spe specifically and what Sarah was addressing was when we have the wildland fire that is a natural ignition, um, there are opportunities and options that our line officers, like Sarah, who get to make the decisions on how can we facilitate potential positive outcomes from that fire. Uh, unfortunately, we've spent a lot of time trying to label these fires, and I've thrown a few of them up there. Maybe you've heard the terms managed fire, fire use, wildland fire use, resource objective fires, and of course the one that makes me cringe a little bit is the letting it burn fire. Um, if I could, before we move on and get into some of our resource and conditions, just leave you with a little bit here, see if I can dispel some myths. And, and Sarah addressed this, that first of all, regardless of the ignition source, uh, human or lightning, all of our fires have a baseline criteria in which they'll be assessed. And as Sarah mentioned right off the bat, we want to know what is the threat to life, firefighter and public safety the threat to life. That's bottom line. We don't care how the fire started. That's one of our first looks. Then, of course, we look at risk to values, infrastructure, communities, homes. We look at the risk and threat to our natural resources or infrastructure. Um, it happens on all of our fires. Some other myths that I think are worth dispelling that we've, again, with trying to label fires, I think both internally and externally, we've struggled in, in educating ourselves on what does this really translate when we make a decision on how to manage or respond to a fire. Um, the second myth that uh, you know, I'd like to try to dispel, 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 um, dispel is that the firefighters have the same tools and strategies available to them, again, regardless of the fire. And I think internally when we talk about a, a lightning fire that might see some beneficial outcomes, it's doing good uh, on the landscape, it's part of the natural cycle. I think there's a myth, there's a tendency to misunderstand that there's a different set of rules or a different set of tools that they're using, and that is not the case. Uh, Another myth uh, that regardless of the ignition source, all of our fires, whether it's a fire in the middle of June that really has us concerned at doing a lot of damage, or it's a fire in the monsoon season that's not moving very far and probably doing good, regardless of those two fires, all fires have some sense or some need of protection as well as a need or, or some avenue to where we may take a less aggressive stance. Even, even on a single fire, there are probably portions on a single fire where we may alter or, or bounce between those needs. 
And it's really, again, based on that baseline criteria of, of assessing where's the need. Um, do we need to expose our firefighters to protect a value? Is there no threat to value? Are we seeing benefit? Maybe we take a less aggressive stance. And so that happens on all fires. It happens on many places or geographically on a single fire. Um, the last myth uh, that I want to address, and this may be more internal, but if there is a concern external with our partners and our citizens, I think there has been uh, some confusion as to how we would prioritize a fire. Do we give less importance, less priority, especially when allocating resources to a lightning fire? And the question is no. Again, I'll take you back to that baseline criteria. When we are in communication at the national level or even the regional level about the movement of resources, aircraft, crews, uh, teams to manage these fires, again, we go back to that baseline criteria. Regardless of the ignition source, regardless of outcome, beneficial or not, we're looking at life safety, we're looking at some probability of success and feasibility that the strategy is going to work, and that's how the allocation of resources and prioritization works. Okay, so, Could I ask you a quick question? Yes. Um, let's say there's a lightning strike in a remote area. Who normally makes the call whether, you know, you, we're expecting rain, we're not expecting rain? Do you, do you allocate resources to put that fire out? Do you let it burn? I mean, I imagine there's a lot of things that go into that. Yeah, yeah you've, you've taken part of my answer, and, and there, there are many, many variables. Um, to answer your first part of the question, the decision ultimately, it, Sarah and her counterparts on the forest, our line officers have the authority to make that decision, and obviously they're supported by the first on the scene. Um, our folks are trained not only in how to pull a hose and dig a fire line, but our folks are getting the training, as, as Sarah alluded, to understanding the natural resource mission of the Forest Service. They're being trained on how to look at certain criteria, look at the questions, all of these assessment of variables. We do weather briefings in the morning, so they're, they're armed with a lot of information before we even know there is a fire. Uh, and then ultimately, the, through communication and the practice of communication, um, we get that information fed up to fire management specialists in our shop and then to the line officer who makes that decision. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would just say that um, whether it's the district ranger or the forest supervisor, depending on the situation, um, it's absolutely a collaborative effort. Um, we have a lot of dialogue. By the time I'm getting a phone call, I've been listening to the radio, and I know that there are a lot of um, there's a lot of information that's going to be coming at me, and um, our fire management officers already know the kinds of questions we'd be anticipating, and it's a dialogue. Well, ultimately, on the dotted line, it's going to be my signature or another district ranger's or the forest supervisor's. It's definitely one you don't make in a vacuum, and it requires the expertise and, and input and um, really collaborative discussion that so we would it's, have. So it's more organic and, and personal than written in a book? Absolutely. Yeah, every every situation is different on any given day, depending on the conditions, and that could be weather conditions, fuel conditions. Um, it could even be dependent on which resources, as in how many firefighters you have available or, or how spread out uh, or thin out we are nationally. Um, a decision to um, do one thing at a specific place on the landscape may be completely different the next day or the next week, dependent on all those different factors. So we don't have... Um, directions we have we don't we don't have um we have what we call sort of a, a doctrine and um, sure. things that we consider but there's no script for this is what you do in this situation it allows us to make um, flexible management decisions based on all those factors great thank you I think uh, we'll move ahead here in the interest of time. A, a final thought before we leave the idea of the collaboration and the sharing of responsibility in fuels treatments. Just a, a very anecdotal observation on my part, uh, but have shared it out loud, and I, I think it's worth sharing. Um, and, and Chief Light reminded me of this the other day uh, that I've said this before. My biggest fear, other than summer camps and having kids in the woods, my second <laughs> biggest fear um, is really not a fire within two or three miles of Prescott. What I'm worried about is the fire on the worst day, five to eight miles away from Prescott, um, where we have not been able to do treatments or where we haven't prioritized, as you know. But what, what I think we've done is we've provided that uh, and with collaboration with uh, the city where they've done their work on, on your side of the, the line, um, we've provided that zone for where firefighters have a fighting chance. 
And I'm just, while you're flipping the page, going to take a second to mention that across the forest, we're actually actually doing landscape scale restoration planning so that ultimately we will be doing some treatments south of the Prescott Basin. And those are going to be really more focused on um, allowing fire to play its more natural role. So we'll have to do some things in advance because we have had um, decades of um, growing without having fire go in there when it needs to. Um, but we are looking forest-wide at those restoration opportunities. We're in major planning efforts right now and it's going to allow us to continue to maintain the hazardous fuels mitigation work we've done while also taking a, a more landscape scale approach to restoring. So where are we at for 2017? Um, I'll, this slide very quickly tells you what you probably already know. It's been a great winter as far as precipitation. There's a four month capture of our uh, precipitation totals on the forest uh, as compared to a 10 year average. But this tells more of a story. I won't bore you with all those little numbers. But these are four of our weather stations that we monitor on a regular basis and use to inform many of our business decisions. What I want to draw your attention to really are the red numbers. And over that same four month period, what, what it's showing you is over 100, almost 150% at our Iron Spring station and over 200% normal on the others for the months of uh, December through March. Good, good news. And we can talk a little bit about what that, what does that mean? Here's another good news slide um, from our folks at the, uh, the, the drought center and the weather service. The only place in the state of Arizona after March uh, that has a concern with moderate drought conditions is the southeast. You can see all of Yavapai County has come out of drought conditions, which, which is good news. Let's hope it persists for a few more years. This is a snapshot of uh, our fire activity last year. And maybe before I address that, let me talk just real briefly as to what we think this moisture and precipitation means. Um, Obviously, uh, with the snowpack that we know has existed on the Muggy on Rim in the northern part of the, air, of, of the state, uh, yeah, this is a general uh, uh, speculation. Things can change. Uh, but I think it'll be more of a moderate fire season, maybe more normal, an old normal. Um, the fire season won't be as long. It probably will take a little bit to start. Uh, and then, of course, the end depends on monsoon season. What it means for us here in the Chaparral Highlands, uh, one thing that we're about to see here in the coming weeks is a pretty tremendous uh, flush of live fuel moisture in our Chaparral species. We suspect that they'll be greening up uh, tremendously here. Usually that's about the 1st of May. And uh, again, a, a sweeping generalization is that ought to moderate our fire season. Again, not an early start. Uh, as some of you may know, we've, we've been in fire restrictions this time of year not too long ago. Uh, we're not anywhere near there right now, which is good news. Of course, the big talk internally is the grass growth. From here all the way to the southeast part of the state, all of this precipitation, especially the most recent rain events, very, the timing couldn't have been more perfect to hit some of those annual grasses and get them to go. Um, the good news is we'll see a flush, a green up to where there's a little bit of resistance in the grass for the coming months. But once we hit June and things warm up and dry out, then, then there's probably, we're thinking a likelihood of a grass fire season, the deserts this year probably will be where the activity is. Now, all of what I say does nothing for how many ignition sources we'll get or where they're going to happen. Um, but that's uh, sort of the summary right there. The last thing I'll leave you with on conditions is I might take all of that back if it remains hot, dry, and windy till from now to, to June. Um, these, these are our telling months. Um, typically with the way the weather pattern set up, we do see wind events in April and May. And of course, we're expecting to see the warm up as we would. And that, that might affect a lot of things. But generally speaking, we're opti more optimistic than we have been in a long time. Um, so this is fire activity from last year. Uh, uh, you can look at the statistics later, but let me draw your attention to the assist down here. Um, something we're proud of, I think somewhat unique to our community. It's not uncommon for Forest Service to collaborate and respond with municipal fire departments or other feds. But I, I think it's fair to say that Prescott is probably one of the most proliferal places this occurs um, and a rich history, 30 plus years of history of collaborating together and training and improving, and we do. Uh, whether it's in the middle of Prescott Valley on the recent grass fire or it's on the, the boundary, um, we often come together. Uh, it's really a matter of fact that we do. 
So here's uh, the, the stuff you've all been excited to hear about, and everybody loves airplanes. This is a National Aviation Resource. This is our snapshot um, this year. The first six items are things that are on a, on a contract, an exclusive use contract nationally. These are all national resources, uh, and, and priorities are set at a national level, again, to where the activities are and where the biggest threats are and where the most likely uh, place to be successful are. We can expect about 21 air tankers on contract. Some already are and working. Two of those will be the large DC-10 that have been common in the last few years. Uh, eight of these MAFs air tankers, and what that is, that's the Air National Guard. Those are Module Airborne Firefighting System is what that stands for, and it's a pretty slick deal. It's been around about 20, 25 years. Um, it's a self-contained unit that slips in and out of C-130s, and we can call those folks when we are starting to exhaust the fleet of contracted aircraft. You can see the rest there, lots of helicopters available nationally. Those seats, that stands for single engine air takers, those are the crop dusters. Uh, most of those are on contract with our partners, the BLM, uh, and a few under the state. And then behind all of those contracted resources, we have access to even more aircraft with cooperation with California, Alaska. These are state contracted aircraft, Canada, and then we have a whole list of CWN or call when needed aircraft. And then finally, same situation, a lot more helicopters available that aren't on contract, but we can call them as we need them. The Prescott National Forest, um, this is the last slide. Let me just tell you real quickly, aside from the stuff that we have here and aside from cooperating with all of our partners in the Prescott area from Central Arizona Fire Authority, the City of Prescott Fire Department, uh, Groom Creek Mayor, we are part of a large national mobilization network where we have access not only to all of the other federal firefighting resources, but much like our collaboration here with, with the city and the state of Arizona, those collaborations exist elsewhere and they're all part of the same network. So when resources become short, we have an easy way to tap into uh, resources that we might, might need. And we don't, we don't always wait for when there's a need. Uh, uh, often that goes alongside our strategy for restrictions. We'll bring in extra resources when we see conditions warrant. So here's a snapshot of the Prescott National Forest, and I'll leave you with this. Uh, we have four lookout towers, and they are all currently staffed. They've been up and running for about 10 days. We have four prevention or patrol units. Uh, we also have additional capacity because we share management organization with the Coconino National Forest in the Verde Valley. So there's more prevention and patrol units there. And the same can be said with our fire engines. We have five fire engines that are Prescott National Forest engines. Three of them are our larger type three engines and we have two of the type six, which are the smaller pickup flatbed style. Uh, again, the Coconino support uh, in the Verde Valley, we have access to those rather quickly. Uh, we have a 12-person fuels crew. Again, their primary mission, like Sarah has talked about, is natural resource management, and they do a lot of our fuels work and our prescribed fire work. They'll come on a little later in the season so that we can have them available to us in prescribed burning, but they are a very valuable uh, suppression resource. They have the capacity and the qualifications, uh, and actually they're quite good, this group of guys, um, to be a, a fire crew as needed. We have our 20-person hotshot crew. We also have our Type 3 exclusive use contract helicopter. All these resources up and running with the exception that the fuels crew again coming up here uh, middle of May, the helicopter will be on on the 1st of May. We have the air tanker base out there in Prescott just improved in 2015 with an extra loading pit and now we can accommodate much of the jetted fleet to the newer uh, generation tankers. We have a national supply cache out here at Prescott at our fire center that supplies fires regionally first across both Arizona and New Mexico but they're also part of a network of supplying fires across the country. And finally, our dispatch office that not only serves the Forest Service, but we partner with the t uh, three other feds, the BLM, BIA, and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Thank you for your time. Question and comments from the council? Uh, yes. Um, I would just like to say Sarah and Dennis and I, are, Chief Light, are in the Senate Rotary together. And uh, Thursday afternoon, we cleaned up up above White Spar, our mile that we do for SunUp. And we were looking at all the different things that we picked up. The item we picked up more than anything else was cigarette butts that people are throwing out the window and they were underneath those pine needles. So people need to be really careful. Thank you for what you do. Nice job, thank you. Councilwoman Wilcox. One of the most serious challenges that the city of Prescott has is sedimentation in our creeks and filling up our lakes. And I know the mastication process is relatively new, maybe a couple years old, and I'm, I'm wondering if you, the Forest Service, 
is studying the effects of that process on erosion and sedimentation of the creeks. So the, um, there's two parts to that. The first is, before we can do anything like that, we have to analyze the effects of those types of treatments. So that's part of our environmental assessment process. We have soil scientists and hydrologists um, that work for us um, looking specifically at effects of sedimentation and effects on our watershed. And so they're using best available science as well as local observation to inform the analysis when we're making a determination as to whether or not we want to do those types of treatments, can and should. Um, so after we've analyzed that and we've determined that it is indeed a treatment we want to, to take on, uh, we, once we do those treatments, we do go back and monitor. It's an interdisciplinary approach that we take to the treatments on the landscape and make sure that what we thought would happen is actually happening. And if we're having detrimental effects, then we adapt, we adjust, and we make changes. Um, in addition, we are working with um, with our educational institutions, and I know we're working specifically with Ecological Restoration Institute to study the effectiveness of upcoming fuels treatments. I'm not sure if they're gonna look specifically at impacts on watersheds. We've asked for soils analysis. Yeah. So we're always continuing to expand our analysis and data collection with our partners, but we absolutely, um, watershed impacts are one of the, watershed in general, watershed health, um, as an agency is one of our highest priorities, and so that trickles down to the forest level as well. So we're always taking a look at the effects on watershed, water quality, water quantity, um, and how our management activities impact those, and we're always looking for ways to improve the watershed health. That's good to hear. We really need your collaboration on the water quality issues. Mm -hmm. If I may, I'll just add one thing on the, the note on water quality and, and treatment. One of the things that that we look at and we try to share is I think as part of our message is uh, the alternative. If we don't do this treatment in the watershed, two things that we'll look at, by treating it and thinning out the, the amount of vegetation to a more historic level, we should expect more water yield. But more importantly is by thinning and reducing the hazardous accumulation of fuels, it's less likely we'll lose the entire watershed in a catastrophic fire, which as you probably are well aware, the runoff and the erosion after a, an extreme fire much more detrimental than what we might incur by treating it. Councilman Chiska. Thanks, Mayor. What is the, what is, is there a number for the ideal number of pines per acre? Probably, um, yes, and we, we know that there's generally, based on the different vegetation type, um, what is historically what we would have expected to see. And I'm sorry I don't have our forester with us now, and we can always provide that information to you. What we know is that we are very overstocked in the Prescott area. Yeah, I, 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 I'm trying to recall numbers that I've heard, but it's surprising. Um, what I will say is if you look um, up the Walker Road area and you look at areas that we've been treating, a lot of um, Prescott residents that have lived here for a very long time think we're just completely nearly clearing the forest. And, and honestly, what we're doing is getting it back to that historical range. So people here are used to seeing very dense forests. And a lot of people that maybe moved from the, from the Pacific Northwest or from the East, in their mind, a, a healthy forest is dense and thick. Um, it's just not the case here. That's not what it's supposed to look like. And those are all the results of us suppressing natural ignition wildfires and keeping fire out of those stands. And so that's why oftentimes our treatments can be very surprising to people that, that especially if they think the only reason we're doing it is community protection. Again, a lot of times we have multiple benefits from doing those treatments. Certainly, um, we end up prioritizing treatments in the areas where we are trying to protect com communities, but in addition to that, we are restoring the forest to, to healthy conditions. So very thin, com comparatively. We could show you photos. We'd be happy to show you those. Well, if, uh, thank you, if, um, if there is a fire in the ladder fuels, how resistant are the tall pines to such fires? Well, I think it would probably depend on the health of the forest at the time. Um, 
if you've gone through several years of drought or if there's been a, a beetle outbreak because those trees are less um, resilient, then those ladder fuels are certainly going to have a very detrimental effect. But anytime you have an overgrowth of ladder fuels that bring what normally in a natural healthy forest would keep that fire at um, a low low intensity fire down on the ground and would just carry through the forest. When you have those ladder fuels, um, you're causing that unnatural reaction, a chain reaction of that fire to jump from what would have been a ground fire up the ladder and into the crowns. And then when you have a, a crown fire, especially if it's carrying and you've got a drought condition, you're likely to have a stand replacing fire. And that's exactly what we don't want from that healthy forest perspective. Thank you. Steve. Um to answer your question about the optimum number, I don't know if you knew Jack Her uh, Herring. He was a dean at the college, and he cataloged all of his trees on his land up in Thumb Butte. And he said historically, if you went history-wise, that we're about twice as much as we should have uh, in that area. <laughs> Councilman Blair? And the number is much higher in other areas, just so you know. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, turning the wheel back and looking at the forest, you go back in 1972, 73, in the Big Bug uh, fire. Um, how often do you go back and look at those areas that have been burned over the past? And the, the philosophy then was it's not to log, let the stuff lay, and it becomes rotten, and it becomes more of a, a problem. And the philosophy of the Forest Service has evolved many different times based upon science. Are we still trying to let the burned areas just be burned instead of going in and being proactive and, and logging those areas and getting them out? I mean, yeah, is that there, philosophy there, change? Well, there's a, lo there's a lot of, there are a lot of answers to that question, but what I would say is that any time we have um, a particularly lar large fire, we're going to take a look at what we need to do to restore the ecosystem. If, if we feel that the fire was stand replacing or has had detrimental effects on the soil, the watershed, um, and the vegetation, the, the ability for that um, to grow back to what the landscape would support. So we do sometimes have salvage sales where if we've had a lot of dead and down trees caused by a wildfire and we feel that the best thing for that piece of land would actually to be to remove quite a bit of that and allow for more of that understory or grasses to start growing up, then we'll take a look at that um, opportunity as well. So every piece of ground is going to have a different approach, but we don't have one approach that we take across the board. It's going to be based on, again, our overall mission, which is to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of our forests and grasslands. And so our response to a wildfire is based on that mission. We want to eventually, if it was a timber producing area and we want it to go back to being a timber producing area, we're going to use best available science to inform the management actions we need to take to move back to that desired condition. Okay. So I, I, I've been up in those areas quite a bit and it's kind of like cutting my hair. Every time I cut it, it seems like it comes back thicker. Yeah. And in the case of like the big bug fire, that's exactly what it did up there. You know, it's come back a lot thicker and more vigorous. So the question becomes like urban land interface, how often do you go back and remove fuels to provide that buffer zone so it's not overgrowth because it becomes more grasses mm -hmm. and more brushy than it did ponderosas because they're gone now or right. they're, they're less. Right. Well, so um, we've got to balance what... Um, what we have in terms of our resources to go back and, and maintain on the appropriate schedule. Um, but we also, sometimes if you've had a stand replacing fire, there's actually been a complete vegetation type change and it may be impossible to get it back to what historically had been there. So in those cases, we do the best we can. We understand what the soils would support now and then we work towards that healthy ecosystem based on what we've got available. But as far as maintenance, um, depending on the vegetation type, we may go back um, every few years to maintain, um, and, and that would be, if that's the schedule, we'd like to get to a point where we don't have to go back and do those mechanical treatments first. We could just do some prescribed fire. And in some places, we don't need to go back that frequently. Chaparral, for maintenance, we may go back maybe every 10 years, though it, well, it would depend. I appreciate what you do because every fire is different. The Juniper Mountain fires that were several years ago, it's now back to a healthy forest you know, from what it was. Um, <clears throat> opposed to the battle fire because they're two different, two totally different areas. So I can understand how you have to treat them differently. 
Uh, the one question I have is I work with uh, State Forester Jeff Whitney, and uh, you know he's trying to get uh, biomass extraction started in Yavapai yeah, County. And I know that uh, you've done quite a bit of NEPAs on your on the forest. I think pretty much to the south and to the west. Is that correct? Most of our currently under NEPA um, parts of the forest are on the Verde Ranger District and the east zone of the forest and then right around the Prescott Basin, though by spring of 2018 we will have NEPA done on the Chino Valley Ranger District. It's going to cover almost in that entire district. That'll be about 600,000 acres that have been analyzed for restoration treatment that will include some biomass availability. Um, and then we'll also be doing an analysis of the 250,000 acres of the Bradshaw District that's below the basin. There are less biomass opportunities there, but we are actually um, making sure that we consider that um, when we're doing the analysis making that material as available as possible. And we're even looking into um, technology that's not currently very easily available, but we know will over time become more available and it's gonna make, um, make it possible to do what we call steep, steep slope logging where we can take materials off of 60% slope, which typically have been much more difficult to log from, and the technology would allow us to bring it off of those steep slopes and up to a road, which makes it more accessible to biomass users or more accessible to the public for fuel wood. So we are going to, by this time next year, we should have almost the entire forest under NEPA, under decisions that would allow for where appropriate for biomass utilization to get, get product. Uh, one of the things I've heard in the past is that, you know, the big problem we have is the archaeological studies that have to be done and in conjunction with the NEPAs and how are we doing on that? Uh, do we have sufficient funding to, to do a fair amount of, uh, you know, archaeological surveys or, because last I had heard we were only doing about three or four hundred acres. Uh, right, we, d we don't have some sufficient funding to do archaeological surveys concurrent with NEPA. Um, our approach on the Prescott National Forest is to do sort of broader surveys during the analysis, have enough information to appropriately analyze the potential effects to our cultural resources, but then when we do have a decision that we can implement from, we do need to um, oftentimes get on the ground and do those surveys, you know, on the ground. It, it's highly intensive and so therefore it is pretty cost prohibitive. Um, we are always looking for ways to find additional funding to support that and we are very effective at getting um, competitive dollars through grants and we also have partners that are looking at the same as well. But to answer your question, we're not going to have it all surveyed as soon as those decisions are signed so we aren't going to be able to immediately go out on any acre of the forest and, and do that work. We're going to be prioritizing with our partners um, and the community to figure out when we have limited resources, where are we going to direct those resources to, to do the surveys? So it's, it's part of the, the bigger long-term strategy, but you're right, um, our cultural resources are certainly one of the things that will be a challenge to overcome. Yep, and I've talked to uh, Congressman Gosar recently, and he's gonna see if he can't get more funding so that you can do more archeological surveys. Um, Congressman Chiska. Thanks, Mayor. With the Yarnell fire, there was a communication lapse at times. What is your level of confidence that you will communicate efficiently with other agencies like Prescott Fire? I'd say the confidence level is very high. Um, I'll go back to a reference I made earlier in the presentation. The, there's a long, rich history uh, in the Prescott Basin of col collaboration, cooperation, and what translates into training together. Uh, just, uh, let's see, this, this Thursday, Friday, uh, we're doing the annual Basin Ops Drill. Um, if you've not heard of it, I would like to inform you of it at, and invite you out to, to come see. This is probably a 20-year-old event, roughly, um, and it, it spawned from working together on fires and realizing hoses wouldn't quite connect together, a green truck and a red truck to get enough water on a fire. From that, 20, 25 years later, uh, we do this annual drill. 
And one of the emphasis, emphasis of the drill is common communications, interoperability, uh, the ability to be on each other's channel, to make sure the radios uh, function the same, even though there's different equipment. Um, and it's not just this drill. This is a, a, a work in progress every year. We revisit this as a group. There's a group of operators uh, made up of all of our fire departments, county emergency services, and of course the city. Um, and they review frequencies, the, the, the grouping of those frequencies, the interoperability of the hardware, um, and then there's meetings on how we're going to respond to these fires even outside of this drill. In that meeting, we had one just two weeks ago over in Prescott Valley where all of the fire departments were represented as well as the Forest Service law enforcement uh, to talk about some of the issues on showing up together on a wildland fire. And one of the premier topics took up probably a third of the meeting was discussing changes in frequencies, the new frequencies, how we'll actually work together, what are the limitations of the equipment. So it's a long answer. I'm very confident um, that, that we're going to be able to talk to one another on the scene of action. Thank you. Any more questions, comments from the council? Any from the public? Thank you. Really appreciate you giving us this information. Thank you very much. Okay. Next subject. Item B, presentation on the water and wastewater utility replacement program. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Handy Ash, Public Works. Uh, great presentation and we really appreciate all the work that Forest Service does, but in order to fight fire really effectively, you need water. That's why we are here to make sure with your help and support, we'll continue to have water. About two and a half years ago, perhaps uh, Councilman Lizelle and Blair remember, we came to Council, we talked about a replacement program, a replacement fund. This is something that we don't have it, and this is not unique to our city. This is really nationwide. We are so far behind the nation, it's become very difficult. So the sooner we start a replacement program, the better we are off in the long run. You know, out of sight, out of mind, and our infrastructure, some of them are about 100 years old, and they can only last so long. If you don't start thinking about it and start replacing, no different than the maintenance you need in your car. You keep doing your oil change or you need to replace an engine or perhaps a car. It comes to the point that everything starts to fail and collapse at the same time, and the city is going to be in a very, very difficult situation, and a lot of monies uh, during emergency situation that we may not have it, but we need to come up with. And generally, when you perform work under emergency, you don't do the right thing. You just want to get it done and fix it. This is why we are here uh, before you. Uh, two and a half years ago, your direction to us, to me, was you come back when you have better information and you can provide us with some numbers and some options. We are ready and here we are today. Uh, we had another presentation with Eric Bay did and based on high customer demand, we're going to bring Eric back in here to give you a little bit of summary of what we have and what are the options. We will come back before you another time to get your direction of how to go about it. Today, just informational. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you, Henry. Uh, Eric Bay, Public Works. Um, I was here about a month ago talking about our centralization project, and at the time, Councilman Lamerson. He asked uh, that I mention a little bit more about uh, utilities. So today I'm going to talk about utility replacement and things that we do to keep the water and the wastewater flowing in the city of Prescott. So quick disclaimer before I start here. Um, 
I'm going to throw out some really big numbers in this presentation, so hold on to your seats. It's kind of a summary of everything, uh, and it's budget numbers, and it's spread over several decades, 50, 60, 70 years. So the numbers aren't really as big as they are going to sound in this presentation. And kind of as Henry said, this asset replacement program is not really a single program right now. We're doing several things uh, kind of to contribute to replacement. I, for instance, I'm working on a storage tank replacement program. Uh, we're doing things with lift station replacement and abandonment uh, to reduce uh, the number of infrastructure that we have and we need to maintain. And also in our CIP program, we've been working on small water main replacement for several years, other things just to get these replacements in place. So while there's not a formalized program, yet uh, we are replacing our infrastructure. And the other thing to remember during this presentation is that replacement is a very, very nonlinear cost. Different things need to be replaced at different times. Uh, big infrastructure needs to be replaced some years, some years it's smaller infrastructure, so very nonlinear cost. And moving forward, uh, one last slide before I start getting into the hard numbers. Why do, we, why do we replace our assets? Well, Prescott, as Henry mentioned, we have everything from brand new stuff down to infrastructure that's 70 plus years old, older than that as well, 80, 90, maybe even 100 years. And the nature of the beast, infrastructure, it gets old. And when it gets old, it fails. What happens when infrastructure fails? Bad PR. Um, nobody wants to have the front page of the paper with the water main break that's causing havoc in the city. Public inconvenience. Say that water main break happens in a roadway, uh, such as pictured right here. Uh, it's just, it's a hassle for our public. Health and safety. This is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, heaven forbid that a water main break near an urgent care center or hospital. Uh, lives are at stake there. Also, heaven forbid that a sanitary sewer overflow happens in a public park where there's family, parents, kids, dogs, grandma, who knows. And uh, Henry kind of touched on this as well. It's expensive to make emergency repairs. When you can plan it out, order your infrastructure, uh, get the repairs done, have a great day, it's much less expensive than when you have emergency crews trying to get everything handled all at once. So here are the numbers. Our existing water system, uh, we have over 7.2 million linear feet of water mains. These are various different uh, diameters and materials. Uh, we have ductile iron pipe, we have cast iron pipe, we have PVC, um, we have a couple different types of concrete cylinder pipe, the C301, which is your pre-stressed, C303, which is your bar wrapped. And that goes with 36 booster stations, various sizes, 25 storage tanks, various sizes, eight production wells, and then one production facility, that's our Chino facility. And here are those numbers that I was warning you about. Uh, water main replacement, um, we're estimating full replacement cost, which includes our valves, hydrants, and PRBs at $450 million. Our booster station, full replacement cost, $42 million. Storage tank replacement, $40 million, and then production well replacement, $16 million, a budget number of about $2 million per well. And you add all those up, and you get a really big number, $548 million. But like I said, we're dividing that over several decades. And these are all averages, as I mentioned before. This kind of gives us something to shoot for, especially when we're doing our rate studies. If we want to have a good water system that has very few failures, say we want to replace in 50 years, we start aiming and, and you know, squirreling away about 10.9 million a year for water replacement. If we want to take a few more risks with uh, failures, maybe we shoot for a 60-year plan. Uh, we guess maybe 9.1 million a year is what we're going to need to spend to keep our infrastructure on the water side up to date. And then the 70-year replacement, this is something that we can shoot for. Um, I hear a lot of people say, hey, we should go for the 70-year replacement. It, it doesn't really work like that. What we need to do, if we want to eye a 70-year replacement, we need to start investing in quality infrastructure today so that it lasts for years to come. Um, so that's something to strive for if we want to go that direction. Uh, and then same bad channel, except for other side of the faucet for the wastewater system, we have uh, approximately 2 million linear feet of uh, sewer mains. Once again, these are various diameters and materials. We have our uh, PVC, HDPE, uh, Hobos pipe, uh, clay pipe, uh, several different materials with 63 lift stations, 
presently our Sunda wastewater treatment plant and then our airport plant as well. Um, same as the water here, the replacement cost for those for the sewer mains, which includes all of our manholes, our clean outs and the appurtenances, $175 million. Lift station full replacement cost, we're estimating at $36 million. Our Sundog plant, um, it now says lift station and equalization here because if you remember back to my centralization presentation, we're decommissioning the Sundog plant. Uh, if we were not doing that, that number would not be $3 million. That number would be $54 million. So that's just one of the many things the Public Works Department is actively doing to try to reduce costs for the city. And then the, uh, the airport plant replacement costs were estimated at $60 million. You know, and the first question that may arise is, hey, didn't we just build the airport plant? Well, yes, we did. And as I mentioned before, this is spread over 50, 60, 70 years. In a couple years, we're going to have an expansion. We're going to need to treat more sewage that goes to the plant, especially with the decommissioning of the Sundog plant. But then over the next two decades, three decades, processes are going to fail. They're going to need to be replaced, and we're going to move forward. Uh, so we're estimating at the end of the replacement cycle about $60 million. Same as water, uh, add up all the numbers, it comes to a really big number, 274 million. Um, we divided it by 50, 60, 70 year. Average replacement, uh, once again, uh, different things are gonna have to be replaced at a different rate. Not all the sewer mains are gonna be replaced at the same rate as the lift stations in our system. But 50 year, uh, estimated 5.4 million a year, probably what we need to be aiming for, 60 year, 4.5. And then 70 year, um, if that's something that we want to strive for, um, which we are, uh, with several different techniques, maybe 3.9 million a year. And when I say that we're striving for that, we're talking to different manufacturers, new technologies, uh, polymer manholes are coming out, um, some really good corrosive, uh, corrosion resistant materials are entering the market. And these manufacturers are touting 150 year corrosion resistance or more. Uh, really a set it and forget it um, type of material which um, will last beyond its design life. Uh, and just to summarize everything, um, because there were a lot of numbers in the last couple slides, uh, if you add up water and wastewater, you know, we, we try to aim for 16.5 million a year, um, and that's gonna give us a replacement of our assets in 50 years. If we were to aim for 60, stretch things out a little bit, 13.7, you know, and then if we were to invest in the, uh, the assets, the quality assets today, maybe try to get a 70 year replacement <coughs> program, we're looking at um, still needing about 11.7 million a year to make sure that, you know, our assets are good and they're usable. Um, and then just kind of a few summary points from the presentation. Prescott owns a significant amount of utility infrastructure. We do have a lot to maintain. So it is a pretty big task. Um, we understand this. Um, every piece of utility infrastructure that we have, it's gonna age. Um, and when it ages, it's gonna need replacement. <laughs> if we don't replace it, it's gonna fail and then it's gonna cost more. Um, and probably the most paramount point of this presentation is we need to be smart about the new infrastructure that we are installing. We need to install quality assets. There are some, there are some materials out there that are not, they're not living up to their design life. Um, they're failing before they should. Um, we've identified those in the public works department and we're doing our best to make sure that the, the pipes, the lift stations, the pumps, everything that goes into the ground is, is very quality material and will last us as long as we need it to. And with that, I'll take any questions that you may have. Questions, comments from the council? I have one. Uh, does our current fee structure support any one of your three life cycle plans? I think Henry's going to take this one. Uh, just the short answer is is no, Mayor. Um, the current uh, financing that is available to us is really enough for the most part to do things that are very necessary, that we know is either something has failed or just about to fail. Uh, these monies are the money that we currently don't have. Uh, we have a, a very good system, and when I attended the, the water summit, Mayor, and you have attended one last year, people from all over the nation, we told them that basically ours is, so far, uh, pay-as-you-go is built in our rates. 
So all the work that we have been doing so far is the work that is it's built in our rate. Uh, as of July of this year, we need to start uh, looking into new rates, and that's a law that we have to do every three years. You know, we we uh, approved the current rate about three years ago. So good part of it is not in. Uh, going back to what Eric said, then he is more diplomatic than I am. When it goes to quality to used, we have engineering standard. We tried very hard using our experience and experience of our colleagues throughout the nation to recommend certain material, pipe material, and so forth. Dr. Lyron versus PVC, uh, that's going to come back to you. Uh, you know, everything is compromised. Everything is we work together as a team. And I think it was a great product we came up with. It wasn't 100% what staff recommended, because once we install something, once we take over infrastructure that is built by the private sector, the city will own it. We don't like to go ahead and replace something after 20 years when it really should last 80 years. These are the things to keep in mind if, in fact, we want to protect the, the city in a long, long term. I know the long answer was no, we don't have it. So what you tell me is if we decide to pick one of your three plans, let's say the 70 year or the 60 year, then we would probably need to have additional funding and would uh, WUFA funding be one of the things we could look at? Yes, sir, uh, we do. In fact, we are borrowing $24 million, I believe, is it 24? Uh, 24 million dollars as we speak towards centralization that you directed us to do. So the money in our wastewater, it's not there. The work that is being done and will be done for the next couple of years is borrowed money. This is only for centralization. The rest, the money needs to come from rate. It needs to be built in rates. For water, we don't borrow anything from WIFA or we haven't yet. So help me understand, so the centralization really has nothing to do with what you've briefed today, or it has some you know, it, ancillary re relationship, right? I, I think partially it does, Mayor, because part of centralization is to replace some of the older, smaller pipes, some of the pump station and others, so yes, it does. Okay. And those things are, for the most part, funded. Okay. Any other questions, comments from the Council? Any from the public? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Next topic. Item C, legislative update. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Tyler Goodman from the City Manager's Office. Here for the legislative update. As always, I'd like to start with the bills that are no longer a concern for us. As you can see on the handout, the first being SB 1329 that had to do with the fire flow requirements that we discussed at length the last time. Well, the sponsor pulled the bill for this session based on the fact that there wasn't enough collaboration, I suppose you could put it, among stakeholders, which is interesting because it got pretty far without collaboration from stakeholders. So either way, we're happy that it's gone for this year. Uh, the next being SB 1371 talked about this a little bit the last time that had to do with hotel ownership for cities um, it doesn't it won't affect us now that the sponsor said that he would run an amendment to exclude charter cities from this and the way it looks now it's held up in rules committee based on some constitutionality issues with it didn't this come up in a charter city though the reason this I believe so well Phoenix is Phoenix a charter city, charter city. yeah so, so yes I find it interesting yeah, so, so the whole premise behind it is, is now gone. Uh, good point. <laughs> Either way, this one doesn't affect us, and it looks like if it does make it out of rules, it won't have the votes to get it on the floor anyway, so that's good news. Moving down, some other items we've discussed, and the other good news, there really hasn't been any new bill that's of concern, so I'm not bringing anything new forward to you. Um, the civil asset forfeiture, um, Chief Black and I talked about this a few weeks back. It changes... Um, the burden from a preponderance of evidence to clear and convincing, so it makes it harder to seize these civil assets. Um, it's actually on the governor's desk as of yesterday. Um, there was an article this morning about it, actually, and it's, it said that the governor, in his quote, he wasn't sure which way he was going to go, whether to sign it 
or to veto it. So keeping an eye on that one. Um, law enforcement is obviously opposed because of the fact that it makes it more difficult to do this and to stop criminal activity um, by seizing those funds and assets. So we'll keep you posted. The following two we've talked about at length as well, the heart and cancer and disease uh, workers comp for firefighters, those two separate bills. It doesn't look like they're going to be stopped. It looks like they're going through without a problem this year. Um, they were held up in the rules committee for quite a while, but they were found proper for consideration. So now they're waiting to be scheduled for a floor hearing. Um, I'll keep you updated as that goes along too. So this could uh, increase our workers' comp costs. Um, I think um, League of Season Towns has a couple other um, bills that they're looking at that might mitigate some of the costs on this or maybe some of the future responsibility. You want to talk about that? Yes, absolutely. So our, our very own Senator Fan has been running a couple of bills. Let me make sure I get them right. Um, SB 1332 and 1407. 1332 would allow for full and final settlement of workers' comp claims, which makes it so that you can do a one-time compensation. It's done rather than prolonging it for a lengthy amount of time. Uh, the second one, 1407, would allow public employers, which aren't currently allowed, to direct care in workers' comp cases. So that could also mitigate some of those costs if, if uh, the claimant is seeking some very high-priced uh, medical care. Um, this is something that's currently allowed in the private sector, but not in the public. So those, those could help mitigate, but still the, the liability would, would be there, um, especially with that cancer bill. It's, it's very wide open, so there's still a concern, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, SB 1063, this is Senator Lesko's bill on PSPR's risk pooling for Tier 3. And going forward, uh, it's placed on the House consent calendar. It's expected to pass. There's no opposition, at least vocally, so no worries there, but we'll keep an eye on it. And finally, the governor's budget. There really hasn't been any news on this yet. There hasn't been a formal budget hearing in either chamber of the legislature, but there have been discussions, and it looks like there is not support from the legislators on this. So the league is expecting to see some alternatives presented, either from the legislature itself or from the governor's office. Um, but right now, it doesn't look like it has the support to go anywhere as is, which is good news. So I'll keep you informed on that. But that's all I have for today, unless you have any questions or comments of other things. Yeah, on SB uh, 1063, do we still have the two tiers there, the 250 personnel uh, or, and above and, and 250 below? Which correct. Of course, fit Prescott, right? Yes, that's okay. correct. Mm -hmm. well, that's a good and news on, that that's still moving. Yeah, yeah it is. That's good. Mm -hmm. And on 1060, 1063, are the uh, entities that are pooling the risk just the smaller entities? Yes, it's, it's the 250 PSPRS employees or less, which we fall into, and, and they are pooling those uncontrollable risks, if you put it. So, yeah. And Tyler, how many are, are in that? Good question. I Could don't, you find that out? Yeah, I, I can find that, that out. out. Yeah, that should be pretty simple to find. I'll get that to you. Any other questions, comments for the council? Any from the public? Hi, my name is Sandra Smith, 701 Whites Bar, Mayor, Council. Tyler, are they asking for proof on the cancer bill that the cancer is directly related to the job? It is presumed that it is, as long as, let me, let me get this straight because I don't want to that's, misspeak. That's bad news. <laughs> it, it's very challenging, to say the least. Um, so what they're asking for, it's presumed to be an occupational disease if the firefighter got a physical exam aligned with the National Fire Protection Association standard and they were not exposed to cigarettes or tobacco products outside the scope of their duties. Whoa, there's a whole lot of cancers that do not fall into that parameter that have nothing to do with fires. The, li the list is very long. I, I can throw in a little bit here. It, it, it is, it's what's called the rebuttable presumption, but I will tell you that the current presumptive cancer statute for firefighters has had a, f a few, I'm talking less than half a dozen that were actually 
um, upheld to be uh, uh, service related. It is, even though it creates this presumption, um, it is a uphill battle for the firefighter to actually establish that the that it was caused by fire service or by, by the job. So, you know, the, the expansion to different, to additional cancers, it's still a fairly tough burden for those, for those employees to, to establish that as a workers' comp, compensatable kind of um, disease. So, you know, in, in concept, I think it's concerning, but if, his, if history is any indication, it, you know, in practice, it's it's a relatively small impact, I believe, on our worker overall workers' comp, particularly because we're in the pool as well, the risk pool, and not every municipality has a fire department, so that workers' comp risk is is even more um, <coughs> diluted, I guess, amongst the risk pool communities, and so um, it's something to keep an eye on. But I don't, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. Well, I just uh, thought I remember seeing something in the bill that indicated that uh, it was presumed uh, to be related to um, their firefighting duties and that the uh, workman's comp had to prove that it wasn't. Well, we have to over what's called overcome the presumption. Um, but again, there are you, you look you also have to look back at um, the history of the firefighter. And again, tobacco is a huge factor that usually overcome tobacco use. Um, overcomes that presumption, uh, and other uh, other other factors can overcome the presumption. Um, and historically, and I think the fire uh, chief light left, but I think the fire department now currently, get, uh, when we get a new firefighter on board, does a baseline cancer screening to determine, you know, that it's that that the person's free from cancer. Um, which sort of sets a baseline because then, but it's, I will say it's not like a military service where you go in and you don't have this and then you come out and you're broken. It's presumed, I mean, it's pretty much to, beyond presumed that it's service related. It's not like that. So again, it, it, it does create the presumption. It's on the, on the insurer to, to overcome that presumption. But overall, historically on this statute, there's been, I think, fewer than a half a dozen that have actually established it uh, statewide. Not, not. I mean, so again, I don't think it's a huge deal. Um, it can, uh, it may or may affect workers' comp premium rates, but probably nominally. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it looks like we're wrapping up a little bit early today. That's great. Uh, Give us a chance to get up and stretch our legs. Uh, we'll start again at three o'clock. And thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>